Welcome back to Razmafsar TV. Today, I'm going to talk about a very important topic, and this topic is about first the, introdu the introduction of a famous sword, a coronation sword, which in German, I mean the correct name is of course in German, is Reichsschwert, and in English-speaking word, it is co uh, called Saint Maurice sword. Now. St. Maurice sword in English, there are two swords which are named St. Maurice, but actually the real name of it should be Reichsschwert, which is the sword of empire, which is also freely translated as coron coronation sword, which is kept in Vienna in Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna. I'm going to talk about uh, this sword. I wrote a couple of years ago um, an uh, article on it based on a very good, uh, mostly based on a very good um, German book on the topic and also other sources. And I'm going to show you a reconstruction of it, which is uh, of this sword, the real sword, which is kept in Vienna, a reconstruction of it, which is kept in Aachen, and also what we did, we I was in a project where in Germany we reconstructed the sword again without scabbard, original scabbard. It has a scabbard, but mostly we just paid attention to the blade and also to the handle. So let me just go ahead and share this with you first. So let me just uh, see here. Okay. Let me go here. Okay, perfect. So if I am um, not mistaken, just a second, please. It just, it was uh, this one. Yeah. Okay. This is the Reichsschwert or coronation sword. Before we go ahead, please take a look at the blade. Take a look at the scabbard, which is uh, made of wood and covered with gold sheath. And then look at the handle and the cross, which are made of solid silver, and they are then gilded. This is important, and this is the silver wiring around the grip. But let me just go and talk about it. The Reichsschwert, uh, excuse me, the Reichsschwert, or the Sword of St. Maurice, as is called in Oakshot, 1991, he called it that way, is kept in Weltliche Schatzkammer in Vienna, Austria, in Kunsthistorisches Museum. In German literature, this sword is known as the Reichsschwert, as I mentioned it, the sword of empire, freely translated, you can call it coronation sword. The book I mentioned before is Schulze Dorla, which you 1995 published, is only about this sword. You really need to take a, uh, to get hold of this uh, book, even if you don't speak German. This is uh, unbelievable. I cannot recommend it enough. Zeitz calls this sword the sword of St. Maurice as well, as Oakshot did. But again, the real name of it in German is Reichsschwert. And you know that I'm a big, big fan of calling the name of the sword in the original culture and not try to transfer. Oakshot cl classifies the Reichsschwert in his classification as type X1 with a pommel type B and a long slender cross Additionally, Auction adds that the blade is 95.3 centimeter and dates it to 1040 to 1120 Anno Domani. This is the uh, Smith mark on the sword on the blade. The sword is made of steel, very good steel, has a good temper, had a good flexibility. Has a total length, the whole um, sword 110 centimeters and the blade is 95.3 centimeter long. There are fullers on both sides of the blade. The length of the fullers, well, on both sides is 69.8 centimeters and is 0 0.9 centimeter wide. I mean, in the beginning, right? The fuller, right? We talk about the fuller. Schultz said Durlam points out that the blade is a type 12, Klingen Typ 12 in German, based on Geibig's classification. Geibig is another great book. I'm going to show you the reference list later in German about uh, medieval swords. According to Geibig, this blade type appeared around the end of the 12th century. Geibig proved that similar narrow fullers of one centimeter width appeared around the 12th century Anno Domani. 
This type of blade can be differentiated from older types of swords of the 11th and mid 12th century that had wider and flatter fullers, often decorated with inlaid inscriptions. Look at the blade again, I repeat. Uh, Schulze Dorland points out that the Reichswert has two silver inlaid maker's mark, that's the maker's mark, silver inlaid, please note, of a simple cross, crosslet in a sun wheel, right? In German, Krückenkreuz, one on each side of the fuller. This is again the Reichswert. Look at this is a magnificent sword. Also, the handle design corresponds to the construction type three, construction type dry, in Gaivik's classification. Take a look at this, please. Look at the sharpened point, how it tapers the sharpened point. Now we go to the pommel. The mushroom shaped pommel is made of gilded silver with curved lower edges. It is not steel. Contrary to the assumption of Oakshot 1991 and North 1994, the pommel and cross guard of this sword are not made of iron nor steel, but of silver, as Schulze Dorlam correctly states. In an email where we wanted to reconstruct it, I remember Mr. Werkner was contacted the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna and they confirmed that the pommel and the handguard were not attracted to a magnet. They ruled out that they were made of and they ruled out that they were made of iron. So they emphasized that they were made of silver, gilded silver. A close look at the ends of the cross guard shows, look at this here, please, uh, that the silver underneath as the gilding is worn off partially in some parts. Here again, I repeat. It should be noted that the gilding is now very faint, which is clear, but the picture here shows it very well. However, however a color, Copper plate engraving made in 1750 Anno Domani and published in 1790 clearly shows a very strong gilded pommel and cross guard that have the same color as the golden panels of the scabbard. That's what I mean. We can the back then originally where they look, what they look like. Because these are, the panels are made of pure gold and here there's gilded silver. Back then they were really matched and now it got, of course, gilded silver. We know it oxidizes, it penetrates and then it changes the color on the surface. So, unfortunately, in many books that depict Reichswert, either the pictures are black and white or the color pictures do not show the gilding very well. For example, see the color depiction of Reichswert in North, or for black and white pictures, see Zeitz and Oakshot. One exception is the color picture showed by Lime's, uh, Lime Sidor in 1999 in the book Le Grand Trésor. The or original title in Italian was Il Grandi Tesori. There, the color picture clearly shows the gilding. But now, this was the museum which offered us the picture. They offered us excellent pictures to reconstruct the blade, the sword. But now, in the internet, in the internet today, back then we didn't have it. It was two thousand three, I remember, if I remember it correctly. Today, uh, everything changed. Today, I mean, we have access to many things, right? Pictures. Schulze Dorlam points out that the shape of this type of pommel had been in use for a long period of time or for a long time and it even appeared in the 11th century. She further assumes that the early appearance of this type of pommel could be the reason of, for Oakshot's assumption that Otto IV could have his coat of arms engraved on an older pommel. The engraved coat of arms or personal arms of Otto IV, 1198 to 1218, of a dama, dami eagle and three leopards on one side is upside down, meaning that it would have been in the right position when the sword bearer carried the sword with its tip pointing in front of them, the emperor. So you see that this, you will see the coat of arms on the uh, pommel later when I show it to you. On the other hand, the other side with the engraved coat of arms of the Reisadler, eagle of the empire, or arms of the empire was in the right direction when the sword was carried in its belt on its waist, when the, when the point of the sword was pointed to the ground. So one side, it's on the right one, where you can see it in the right, and when you hold it, when you hold it in the hand, right, then, uh, it, then you see that it's in the right direction. The engraved inscriptions on the pommel on both sides of coronation liturgy and taken from Psalm 144, Vulgate number 143, and read as the following. Benedictus Domini, those 
or devs key docet man man okay sorry for my bad latin pronunciation be praised my lord and god who teaches my hands to fight just imagine be praised my lord and god who teaches my hand to fight unbelievable look at this here here they can they can take a look at it that's the Reisadler. you see that and here you see that three leopards and then the damai that's what we talked about it damai eagle right we said that it's on one side upside down right because once you hold the sword tip upward they will be in the right direction and this is the way when they carry it on this side they carry it on the belt because then it was in the right direction, the eagle, high sattler, and the other side, when you hold it in front of you with the scabbard tipped down, it was on the right. So the engraved inscriptions say, again, be praised my Lord and God who teaches my hands to fight. Here you have this uh, Damai eagle and three leopards. Again, both sides say the same thing if you take a look at it, right? Again, Benedictus. Dos o dominus devs qui docet man manus o manus manus sorry manus yes be praised my lord and god who teaches my hands to fight. I swear. So Schulze Dorla, the cross guard, states that the inscriptions on the pommel on the cross guard resemble each other and should have been produced at the same time. She explains that the slender cross guard is made of gilded silver, is 19.7 uh, centimeter wide, uh, wide, the width of it, and narrows slightly towards its and tapers. In the first view, the cross guard can, alone cannot be used for dating purposes, as this type of cross guard can be seen on many swords from the 11th, 12th, and 13th centuries. But, however, as the cross guard extends 7.4 centimeters from the blade on each side, the cross guard should be from the late development stage of this typology and should have been made at the earliest during the 12th century. The upper side and the bottom side of the cross guard of the high thread are engraved with parallel lines close to the edges of the cross guard. Additionally, there are yellowed tendrilier ornamentations on the sides of the opening for the tang of the blade, when you look at it. Uh, on the from up. She, Schulze Dorlam emphasizes that she has not seen similar ornamentations on the cross guard of other swords of the same type and adds that the research done by Geibig shows that the majority of cross guards and pommels of these swords from the 10th to the 12th centuries do not have any decorations. On the front and back of the cross guard of the Reichsbert, there is an engraved verse of the lords and tripartite um, canticles which were used to render homage to the newly crowned monarch. If one holds the right sweat with its tip of the blade pointing up, the following inscription is visible on the back of the cross guard. Christus vincit, Christus reinat, Christus imperat. Christus triumphs, the translation in English. Again, Christus triumphs, Christus reigns, Christus rules. The engraved inscriptions on the pommel on both sides, again, we I say we're coronation liturgy, liturgy, just in contrast, be praised my Lord and God who teaches my hands to fight. And here, Christus triumphs, triumphs, Christus reigns, Christus rules. Right? So this, we talked about it. So. Yeah, we already mentioned that. Shose Dolam explains that the better theological translations of the Latin lords above would be the following. Christus the victor, Christus the king, Christus the ruler. If the tip of the high sword points to the ground, a shortened form of the lords can be read on the front side of the cross guard. Note that there are columns between the swords. Here you see Christus vincit, Christus reinat, Christus triumphs, Christus reigns, again on the other side of the cross guard. The handwriting on the handguard resembles the inscriptions on the pommel. Therefore, both should have been engraved in the same period of time or same time. The tripartite canticles for Christ on the sword that were also used for religious and secular leaders should have been created during the second half of the eighth century in France. And they should have been used in coronation liturgy for the first time during Easter of 774 Anno Domani after Charlemagne conquered the empire of Lombards or Langobards. Latin Langobardi. 
Schulze Dorla adds that this Frankish Roman type of waltz remained in use in the coronation ceremonies of kings until 1209 Anno Domani. Then Pope Innocent III introduced another coronation liturgy for the coronation of Otto IV. The coronation liturgy did not include the above mentioned laws anymore. Schulze Dorlam explains that the reasons for the engraving of the coronation liturgy in the Heistrebet could be to protect the king from harm and mischief as the liturgy includes a war cry, again, a war cry against all evil powers in nature and the world. Schulze Dorlam adds that people in medieval times believed in the apotropaic effect of this smell, as the same inscription was engraved on bells, coins, and weapons. She quotes on uh, von Schlosser, who explains that the inscriptions on the cross guard with the words Reinat and Reignat are a linguistic peculiarity that points to the Southern European origin of the weapon. Based on this, um, Weix Gertner concludes that the sword should have, it should have an Italian origin. However, Schulze Dorland points out that Professor Max Fister, Fister, Professor in Ordinary for Romance Languages and Literature in the University of Saarbrücken explains that the way of writing distinguishes the way a Romance speaking person from the North, as well as the South of France should have used medieval Latin. The form Reinat and Reinat point out that the writer pronounced Reinat in a Romance language as Reinat and writes the grapheme once as in and once as in. She quotes Spender, who based on the shape of the letters and the whole appearance, dates the inscriptions on the cross guard to the 11th century. Spander bases this, his assumption on the similarity of the inscriptions on the cross guard of the Reichsschwert to the inscriptions uh, on the Reichskreuz, Empire Cross, of Conrad II and the inscriptions on the silver sheets of the Holy Lands and were ordered to be engraved. By Henry IV, on the other hand, Schulze Dorlam states that Philips suggests that the split ends of the letters and clear tendency towards broken forms, especially C, R, V, and E, justify a later dating to the era of Otto IV. The handle of the Reichswert is wrapped with a twisted silver wire at both extreme ends of the handle and extra twisted gilded silver wire. You see on top here, they're gilded. Silver wire um, is wrapped around the handle. Schulze Dorlam says that Philips and Schramm and Mütterich suggested that the silver wrapping should have originated from the 16th or 17th century. However, she explains that simple wire wrappings could be seen in many medieval swords, such as the sword was excavated from the Rhine River in Mainz. Guy Big 1991, plate 76. The swords excavated from two Hungarian warrior graves from Besh Teresh uh, Gyalapatana of the late 10th century, the sword of St. Stephen kept in the treasury of Cathedral of Prague, the Viking swords from the 10th century from locations in Busdorf, Westerhoek, and London, or with the sword with round pommel from the late 12th century in Musée de l'Armée in Paris. See Zeitz 1965, plate 133. Schulze Dorlam quotes Kaibi, who is of the opinion that medieval swords with handles wrapped in silver wires were mainly used for ceremonial purposes. Schulze Durham points out that possibly only an, an aristocrat could have afforded a sword with silver wire wrapping on the handle. Dating? Schulze Durham says that a detailed analysis of Reichsschwert shows that all parts of this weapon were made at the same time, meaning at the end of the 12th century. And the assumption that a new handle was added to a sword from the 11th century is not correct. She adds that the sword is typical is a typical weapon from the 12th century that is surely dated with the coat of arms of Otto IV, 1198-1218. She proposes that Reich, the Reichsschwert was possibly used in the coronation of Otto IV in place of the other coronation sword from the Salian period. The Reichsschwert belongs to the group of combination type 18, see Geibig, that appeared during the 12th century and remained in use until the 13th century. Following Geibig, as far as today's Germany is concerned, swords of this type were limited to the southern parts of the country. However, similar types were found in many other European countries. She explains that the high shred with its steel blade, gilded silver cross guard, and pommel with engraved inscriptions and yellowed tendrilier ornamentations stands out when compared to other Romanesque swords from southern Germany as the cross guard and the pommel of letter swords were at best decorated with silver and brass inlaying or covered with a silver plate, as is the case with the sword from Salentan, Kier, uh, Pirates. However, it is 
surprising to see that the Reichswehr that was used for coronations of German kings and emperors of the Holy Roman Empire is kept with simple ornamentation but com when compared to the coronation sword of the French kings, the so-called joyeuse that has a pommel handle and cross guard made of pure gold decorated with elaborate and ornated reliefs. Schulze Dorlam explains that uh, as no other swords with similar maker's mark were found, the question of where the sword was made cannot be answered with certainty. However, the sword could not have been made in Saxony, the area of origin of Otto IV, as the Romanesque Middle Latin inscri inscribed on the cross guard makes likely France as the country of origin. She stresses that it is important to take into consideration that Otto IV, who was born as the second son of Henry the Lion in 1177 Anno Domani, spent his youth in the court of his uncle, the King of England, who had nominated Otto IV as the Earl of Poitou and Duke of Aquitaine four years before he became the German king. Schulze Dorlam proposes the possibility that Otto IV could have what brought the sword from France that was later used for his coronation in Aachen in 1198 Anno Domani. Scabbard, according to Schulze Dorlam, the scabbards of medieval swords were mostly made of wood or leather, and therefore majority of them are not extant. Therefore, of course, some exceptions such as the leather scabbard on the belt of St. Hadrian from the 13th century that is kept in the Historisches Museum in Bamberg, Schulze Dorlam adds that the scabbard of the Reichswehr is another rare example that has survived. The scabbard of the Reichswehr is one of the most beautiful works on sword scabbards. It is 100, 101 centimeter long, 6.7 centimeter wide close to the scabbard mouth and 3 centimeter close to the shape meaning that it tapers towards its end. The wooden scabbard consists of two slats of hard olive wood and that is encased with um, gold panels. The edges corners of the scabbard are covered with bands of gold plates from the scabbard mouth to the scabbard chain. In the middle of these bands are garnet stones in bezel settings encircled with ringed pearl wires. The outer, the outer edges of these bands are also decorated with pearl wires. Scabbard, the gold panels on the front and back of the scabbard have 14 rectangular figures of standing kings with a posse work. The figures are placed in a way that they are right way up in the right position if one holds the sword with the tip showing upward. Oxshot deducts from this fact that the Reichswehr scabbard was solely made for ceremonial purposes, such as coronation, pur coronation purposes. Oxshot suggests that the scabbard and the sword itself were made in the second half of the 11th century, just to have a reminder. Between each pair of panels, there is an enameling work in the form of tiny squares of squares of red, white, and blue that are, that are set in diaper pattern. Schulze Dorlam explains that the decisive hint that the scabbard was made during the Salian period and not during the era of Otto IV is due to the number, sequence, and identi identi identity of 14 monarchs. She does not agree with the assumptions of by Haupt. Kashinitz and Sharman, who suggest that the number of monarchs is a symbolic sequence of 14, two times seven of anonymous rulers. Moreover, she explains that this is a sequence of German kings and emperors from Charlemagne to Henry III, and states that the most important evidence for this assumption is that it's next to the youngest ruler, namely Louis IV, um, the child 911 Anno Domani. There is a carved inscription, Le Rex, King. Uh, Schulze Dorlam stresses that many researchers either understand it as a late addition or misinterpret its meaning. If one counts the rulers from the scabbard mouth to the scabbard shape consecutively, then this figure can only be added to the young and birdless king number six, namely the last Carolingian Ludwig IV, the infant. This German monarch ruled from 900 until 911 Anno Domani and was never, never enthroned as the, um, the emperor. Ludwig IV is the only monarch on the scabbard that is provided with this letter. This is due to the fact that only German kings and emperors are portrayed on the scabbards and not kings of West Franks and Italian monarchs who were crowned, such as Emperor Charles the Bald, uh, 875 to 877 Anno Domani. Further, Schulze Dörla states that this inscription does not take the division of the empire of 876 Anno Domani into consideration because from the three sons of Louis the German and Louis II, 847 to 876 Anno Domani, namely Charles the Fat, 876 to 887, Carloman King 
king of 876, 887, and Louis III, the younger king of 876 to 882. Only Charles the Fat, 876, 887 is portrayed on the scab. The reason for this is because Charles the Fat was the only one who was not only a king, but also an emperor, and who reunified the whole empire under his rule. Schulze Dorland does not agree with Spander, who considered the end of the sequence of 14 rulers with the Sally and Conrad II, 1024 to 1039. She stresses that the end of the sequence is with the son of Conrad, namely Henry III. It is important to take into consideration that some of the rulers' faces in gold repose are crushed and not easily recognizable. However, the copper plate engraving of the scabbard of the rice sword, as shown before from 1751, shows the figures in perfect state. So a comparison identification could be made. These are here, okay, the rulers, I'm just reading the first, Charlemagne, Karl de Grosse, Louis de Pius, Ludwig de Fromme, Louis de German, Louis II, or Louis de Bavarian, in German, Ludwig de Deutsche, Charles de Fat, Karl de Dicke, Arnulf von Carinthia, Arnulf von Kärnten in German, Louis IV, the child, Ludwig IV, das Kind, Konrad I of Germany, Konrad I von Franken, Henry I of Germany, Heinrich I, the Erste, Otto I, Otto I, Holy Roman Emperor, Otto I, the Große, Otto II, Holy Roman Emperor, Otto III, Holy Roman Emperor, o Henry II, Holy Roman Emperor, Conrad II, Holy Roman Emperor, and Henry III, the Black or the Pious, in German, Heinrich III. So, Schulze Dörler adds that the very fact that Sally and Heinrich III is portrayed as the 14th and last king of the scabbard does not mean that the scabbard was made for him. She suggests that his son, Henry, should have ordered the scabbard to be made. She asks that the reason that he was not portrayed could be due to the Christian humility or because of keeping the symmetry of the figures. Additionally, Schulze Dorla argues that the engraved inscription L. Rex proves that the scabbard of Reichswert was not made during the reign of Otto IV. If it had been the case, a symbolic number of two times seven rulers, Christian symbolism for the numbers two and seven would have been chosen instead, and the nomination of the young king with the number six would have not been made. Sam would have not made sense. Contrary to the assumption of Felix, who considers the inscription L. Rex as the cursoriness in engraving, Schulze Dorlam identifies them as Latin capital letters. She adds that similar letters were used often on engraved Romanesque bronze bowls in the second half of the 12th and 13th century. However, they were not also used in um, Ottonian and Salian eras. As evidence, Schulze Dorlam provides the name descriptions next to the reliefs of King Otto III and the express Teofano on the front cover of Codex Aurasius of Echternach, as well as the engraved portrait of Saint Mauritius on the back cover of Mauritius Evangelia, Evangeliers of Mines from the middle of the 11th century, as well as the inscriptions on the gravestone of Archbishop Limar from Bremen, died in 1101. For further evidence that the sword scabbard was made during the second half of the 11th century, see Schulze Dorna. Now, this is a reconstruction of Reichswert of Burg Trifelis. You look how beautifully it's done. This is not what we did. What I'm going to show you, that was the second reproduction, reconstruction. This is the first one. It is important to take into consideration that the Reichswert was already copied and reconstructed by Paul Boimers in 1915. This copy exactly matches the original in all aspects, meaning the whole sword is scabbard and is kept in Konungsal, the Slot Houses in Aachen. Lower, but now in Brook Three Flares as well. So look at this. So now I stop here and then later on I'm going then to continue and to talk about how we reconstructed the whole sword. Not the scabbard, original scabbard reconstructed, but we did the sword, pommel, handle, and the blade. So please stay tuned and we will see the about the reconstruction process.